Coming up on Main Challenge, Hannah Pingree, the Director of the Office of Policy, Innovation, and the Future. Hello and welcome to Main Challenge production of Lincoln County TV and Lincoln County Indivisible. I'm Chuck Kruger, and our guest today is Hannah Pingree, the uh, Director of the Office of Policy, Innovation, and the Future. Welcome, Hannah. Thanks, Chuck. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. I'm still in my mind. I, ha I want to call you Madam Speaker. Well, you should, you should always call me that, Chuck, but yes, I, Chuck and I served together in the Maine legislature. He was one of my favorite members, so it's, I'm sorry we couldn't be together in real life, but it's great to see you. It is good to see you, and I'm so glad that you are uh, part of the governor's team. Uh, I, I think like a lot of people, when I saw the name of your office, I said, what? Uh, but it, it starts to make more sense as you, as you look into it. And I guess we should maybe jump right in. Um, I have read and looked at uh, uh, the Climate Council report, and I'd love to hear you talk about putting together the Climate Council, which is a pretty impressive group of, of Mainers and people who care about Maine. Um, and how the report came together. It's been out for about a month, I guess. Uh, and it, it's, it's impressive, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's foreboding as well. So I'd love to hear how that came together and what your expectations are for both the near term and the long term. Sure, Chuck, happy to talk about that. So the, the, the mission of our office is to be, is to think about the future and long-term issues facing the state. And when the governor took office, climate and energy issues were among her top priorities. I think, you know, she like many feels that uh, climate change is here. It's impacting all aspects of our state from our warming Gulf of Maine to invasive species, ticks, um, obviously lots of different challenges for our state's economy, our health, our people. So uh, she, she said, we're not just going to come up with another report, we're going to take action. So in the le legislature um, in 2019, they passed a pretty sweeping climate action law that created the Maine Climate Council and also set emission reduction targets in law. So we have to reduce Maine's emissions 45% by 2030 and at least 80% by 2050. Um, in that same legislative session, they called for 80% of our energy in our electricity sector uh, to come from clean and renewable sources. So those couple <laughs> things have really driven our work of the Maine Climate Council. And the Climate Council is a 39-member group that includes head of the Maine Lobsterman's Association, the Forest Products Council, youth members, members of her cabinet, and scientists, and many others. And we've been tasked with putting together a four-year plan to start taking action. Um, so again, reducing our emissions, but also preparing our state for the impacts of climate. Coastal communities already seeing erosion, sea level rise in lots of different aspects of climate. Um, I think the, the good news about all of this is that while it's overwhelming foreboding, climate action in Maine can actually mean a ton of economic development and good paying jobs. So, Transitioning from buying oil from, you know, other states, other countries to producing clean power in Maine that, you know, powers our cars and our homes, um, that is a good way to create jobs and economic activity. And we're already seeing that in our state with solar, with wind, um, with lots of other innovation. Um, we're seeing that with new heat pumps being installed. So there's actually lots of positive um, activity that can come with climate. So that, that's part of our goals. So I would just say the other big thing is, is this wasn't just this 39 member group. Um, we had six different working groups that had hundreds of main people, you know, municipal leaders, uh, stakeholders from across the board who participated in this work. And we got thousands of main people to weigh in with their opinions. So this report is, a, is came from about, about a year and a half worth of work, but tons of input from main people sort of telling us we wanna take action, um, 
they gave us specific suggestions of how to do it, um, how it could best impact communities in our economy, things to not do. So the report is really a reflection of all of that. Um, I highly encourage people to go check it out. Our website um, is climatecouncil.maine.gov and it has the full climate action plan and you can read the deep details of every working group, the science group um, and others, or you can see the high level report and kind of the summary of the actions that we wanna take over the next four years. But I think, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We know people are struggling. It's a challenging time. And the governor, when she released this report on December 1st, which was our big deadline, she, she was very clear that, you know, we can't wait to take action. The report is called Maine Won't Wait. Um, and we see that economic rebuilding, um, making our state more resilient to future crises, um, that's really kind of the, the underpinning of the whole report. And I will say we, we are starting to see uh, with a new administration coming in in Washington, um, obviously a much greater focus on issues of climate and energy. Um, so that's really hopeful for, for our ability to take action as well. The... Um <clears throat> the the office is a part of the governor's office, right? It's not a cabinet level uh, office. Is it essentially what the planning office was back before LePage? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say so. So the governor, our office is called the governor's office of policy, innovation, and the future. And the governor talked about it in her inaugural speech. She quoted Kurt Vonnegut that said every go government should have a department of the future. And we're not exactly the department of the future, but we are a, a group of uh, a small office, eight or nine of us focusing on long range policy issues. Um, so under the previous administration, um, Maine did uh, basically break up the state planning office, uh, got rid of some of its functions and then farm some of them out to other agencies. So the sort of former office that worked with municipalities and worked on you know, long-term planning issues, economic issues was dissolved. So the governor's intention was to start to rebuild part of that to basically help her in kind of thinking long-term and big. So climate is a major area of focus. About half of our staff works on climate. We work in partnership with the governor's energy office, uh, which is really a key part of this work. Um, we also uh, host the Office of Opioid Response, Gordon Smith, who really is a one-man show working across state government to focus on, obviously, the urgent issues of, of opioids and, and how we best respond and help people through recovery. Uh, we host the Children's Cabinet, the Governor's Children's Cabinet, which is a cross-agency group trying to improve the lives of, of children and youth. Um, and then we also work on long-range economic issues in partnership with a number of different agencies. So workforce issues. Uh, we put together the governor's economic recovery committee and its recent report that just came out. So essentially, we both look long term, but part of our goal in charge is to work across state government. Um, the governor has been really focused on, we can't have a bunch of siloed agencies doing their own thing. We need to figure out ways to work together. So we do a lot of facilitation of these kind of big group projects where it really is important for outside stakeholders, for, you know, businesses, for nonprofits, but also state government to really work together in a more collaborative way. Um, and again, as, as you know, Chuck, the challenges right now are pretty significant, you know, from, from COVID to economic challenges um, to issues like climate and opioids. So we have plenty of work for our small staff, but but so far, um, I'm really proud of the work that a, a great team and a great staff have been able to do. Well, getting back to the um, the, the Climate Council report, which is, uh, I, I can't emphasize how big it is as I see it and important. And if, we, if, if, if you and we follow through, uh, it will be some serious progress made by your office and by the Mills administration. Um, I'm interested in how you plan to corral the resources needed to make the report function properly. And mo even more important, how do we engage everybody so that we all get involved? I mean, I try to use less plastic. We, we try not to drive as much, but I, I can't say that we're heroes of the environment in my household, and we're probably ahead of some. So, yeah, how, where do the resources come from, and how do we engage the public? Yeah, I mean, Chuck, those are probably the two most important questions to how we make this happen. Um, I would say 
uh, the state is already um, focusing resources. There are things like our new energy procurement. So we are trying um, as a state, this is not sort of up to every individual, but it's state policy to procure more and more of our electricity resources from clean and renewable sources. So, and that is already happening. It doesn't take more state money. Uh, the state is already buying solar power, for example, at a cheaper cost than natural gas. So not everything about climate is sort of pain and suffering and cost. Um, and certainly a lot of it isn't. It is, you know, when we rebuild a roadway and make it higher or we rebuild a sewer plant and put people to work and, and do infrastructure improvements we had to do anyway, we do them with a more planful eye to climate and sea level rise. And, and at the same time, we put people back to work. So obviously, I think there's a lot already happening. Um, Efficiency Maine is one of our key partners. So we have a number of different efforts that are funded um, through Efficiency Maine's programs to, for example, we have rebates for new hot water heaters that are run by heat pumps, new heat pumps that heat your home. Um, and by doing those things, you can save money every month with cheaper electricity um, than buying you know, huge tanks of fuel oil. Um, you will use less fossil fuels and you can better heat your home. So obviously there's, there's a lot happening. I will say that the governor is planning to go to the legislature this session seeking bonds for additional infrastructure. We wanna double the rates of weatherization in our state. So obviously making people's homes more efficient. Um, especially middle income, low income seniors um, who can't afford it. Uh, there, it will require investments to do this work, but by doing it, we put people to work and then we save people money every month on their heating bills. So it's a win-win. It requires some upfront investments, but it, it, it is certainly, we think, uh, worth the cost. Um, kind of the two major parts of climate activity are uh, where do most of our emissions come from? More than 50% from transportation and about 30% from our buildings. So some of it are individual actions. Um, we are looking at ways to help people drive less. Currently this world of Zoom is helping a little bit, um, but we know lots of people still need to get to work. So increasing you know, creative public transportation strategies and then over time, more efficient cars, and then electrification, plug-in hybrids. I mean, that's the direction Detroit's going. It's the di direction automakers are going. And it is the direction that Maine will eventually be going. So the report does call for more and more of our cars to be plug-in hybrids or ele fully electric. And so putting in the infrastructure to make that possible, as well as rebates so that people can afford these cars while they're slightly more expensive, um, that's where we're focusing. So those things are already in place. Um, we're currently spending money from uh, VW from their, their emissions cheating scandal um, to help people have rebates to buy these cars. Um, we have a significant new rate rebate for low income people as well as for municipalities who want to experiment with this technology. Um, but I, I have to tell you, I, I got an electric car last year. It works great. It works fine in the winter. It even gets up and down my driveway. Um, I know lots of main people are waiting for the new Ford F-150 electric, they're, they're waiting for four-wheel drive. And I think as those models come online and be, they become cost competitive, um, you know, we're gonna see a major transition. Um, we have other states, uh, California and others who have already committed to no new gas burning cars after 2035, new cars to be purchased. So the re revolution is here and that is where a lot of our emission reductions are gonna come from. Um, but I think again, uh, there are lots of other areas where uh, we are very focused on our forest product sector, for example, or our farming sector, where we can both support economic activity. So forest products are a huge source of, you know, mass timber, of new biofuels, of ways of combating the climate crisis, but also putting people to work. So it's not all pain and suffering, Chuck. Um, I think there's a lot of climate action that will actually vastly improve our main economy, make us more sustainable. It will require infrastructure investments over time, um, and we are asking the legislature to, to support those, um, but, but nothing radical. And I will say we are certainly seeing an administration um, in Washington come in with this Build Back Better theme, which is how do we rebuild our infrastructure, our transportation systems, our energy systems to support American jobs, um, to be more efficient and sustainable, and to put people to work. So, it, it seems like a win-win. Certainly the federal participation will make a big difference, 
Um, I will say our entire delegation was on board at our climate kickoff. Um, they all really are leaders in different aspects of this. Um, so Chuck, we'll keep reminding you of things that you can do, but think about installing a heat pump over the next five years, check out an electric car, um, you know, do all the things. Um, but again, I think that a lot of climate action can actually improve people's lives, can make their homes more comfortable, more, more, you know, environmentally sustainable, healthier. So I think there's a lot of win-wins. And it's, it sounds like the attitude of the administration is that it also is good for the economy. And, and that's, that's something not, that shouldn't be lost on a lot of people, that it's not going to cost us, as you say. It's not all pain and suffering. There's some real benefits that can be derived, and we just need to make progress every day, every month. Yeah, and I, one of the goals of the Climate Action Plan the governor really led with are, is her goal to double clean energy and efficiency jobs by 2030. So we currently have about 15,000 people employed. We want to double it to 30,000. And again, this is heat pump installers. This is energy efficiency installers, solar installers. Those are the fastest growing sector of our economy nationally. And we want to see that same kind of action in Maine. And we're already starting to see it. So we think lots of good paying jobs, significant economic activity, the same thing with resilience activity, you know, rebuilding infrastructure, sewer plants, roads, bridges, all of this um, is climate acti acti activity that will create good paying jobs. And I will say one of the foundations of our report, our natural, our natural resource economy, we know that climate impacts forestry, agriculture, fishing, they all are climate impacted, but if we can help those industries um, diversify, protect them from the impacts of climate, help them better understand the science of what's happening in each of these sectors, um, we can make sure that those industries stay thriving. So I will say that this report is just as much about Maine's economy as it is about climate. Um, again, highly encourage people to check it out. Um, the website's climatecouncil.maine.gov. Is there a, I mean, where we're, I'm always looking for the upside on one of the, on these kinds of situations. Is there a way that we can be better sit, climate citizens and fight off this, this attack of COVID that nobody really anticipated and nobody totally knows how to deal with? Uh, is, is, does that tie in at all or is it, are they independent tracks? No, there's, there have been a number of overlaps. I mean, I will say, you know, for example, to reduce transportation emissions, we do all need to drive a little bit less. Um, I certainly hope that kids fully get back in school and they're not, you know, on their computers from home all for the rest of the years ahead. But things like telemedicine, things like, you know, going to conferences and meetings via your computer rather than driving long distances. I think many of those things are here for the long term. So We've learned lessons about what's possible during COVID that, that are helpful. Um, I will also say that, you know, we've seen the impacts um, in COVID of, of supply chains that are overly reliant on international and, and, you know, from PPE to our food, you know, relying on supply chains coming from China, you know, it's not a long-term sustainable thing, especially during a time of, of economic disruption. So we are learning lessons. We are, we have a goal in this plan to, double the amount of food that Mainers eat coming from Maine. So that's good for our economy, but it's also good for future crises like periods where, you know, relying on ourselves, um, you know, offers a lot of independence um, and, and freedom and all those good things, um, Chuck. So I, I will say there are lessons. Currently, we know that thousands of Mainers have lost their jobs. Um, we know that there are climate impacted jobs like tourism that are also were significantly impacted by COVID. So how do we make those industries uh, more sustainable? How do we help some of those workers transition into good paying jobs in other sectors? Um, there, there certainly are, um, there are similar overlaps. Um, I think we, we all, um, we don't see a lot of silver linings of COVID because it's clearly been a very difficult time for lots of people and businesses in Maine. Um, but we're certainly learning lessons about, you know, how we better prepare for the, the next crisis to come. This is a little bit out of your uh, agenda for your office, but a lot of us on the coast 
are, were very disturbed to learn <laughs> that the Penobscot Energy Recovery Plant is importing baled plastic from Ireland to run the dump. And I'm wondering, do you have a thought on that? We can't be doing it right if we're, if we're engaging shipping companies to bring waste into the state of Maine. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can't. I have the same level of, I was disturbed like you were, Chuck, to see, um, you know, plastic washing up on the shores near the island where I live, on, obviously on Sears Island. Um, you know, this idea that we need to import trash from Ireland to keep uh, our waste facilities burning, to keep them economically viable, that, that's obviously not a winning strategy. I mean, I would say the climate report doesn't delve deeply into waste issues. We know that, that the amount of stuff we all buy and, and trash obviously does, start, does fuel climate um, related uh, emissions. Um, my co-chair of the Maine Climate Council, Melanie Loisam, the, the acting DEP commissioner, I mean, this is fully in her wheelhouse. And I know she was disturbed. Um, you know, she wasn't aware of this activity. And I think there'll be a lot of discussion in the upcoming legislature as to how we avoid this. Um, you know, how we create a business model that doesn't require imported trash that's, you know, not great for our environment. So again, I, I guess I can only say, Chuck, I like the governor, you know, I'm frustrated by this. I think we're all trying to better understand the circumstances that, that led to, that are leading to importing trash and how we can better avoid it. Um, so it's, it's on our minds and I'm, I'm, I guarantee it will be discussed on a Zoom screen in Augusta in the coming months. Well, that's good to hear. It's, it, it is very disturbing for, for a lot of us to, I mean, I just had no idea that we were actually doing that. And I understand the technology of it, but I, I remember being sold on the idea that, that Maine was producing enough trash to, to make this trash to energy conversion work. And now I find out they're filling ships full of plastic waste and bringing it here. And I'm thinking that ain't right. And I hope we can, I hope, as a team, we can we can fix that and make that work better. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, but I also wanted to touch on the uh, non-climate issues that your office will be facing in the next few years, and maybe a little bit about how your administration is going to take it on. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a couple big areas. The children's cabinet work, I mean, obviously, there's always a lot of overlap. So, you know, how do we make sure parents have access to high quality child care and early care education so, is a major area of focus. How we make sure our young people, especially those most at risk, are doing okay and also ready for good paying jobs of the future. Um, you know, that's highly linked to our future economic prosperity. I mean, Maine doesn't have enough kids so we really need to take care of every kid we've got. Um, clearly, I don't. I know I don't need to tell you or anybody else about the challenges of the opioid crisis. The governor has really made a focus on treatment and recovery a key, and again, helping these Mainers who have struggled to get into recovery and back to good-paying jobs. You know, key to their families and our state's economic prosperity. Um, I will say probably. The couple other big office, big issues that our, our office is focused on in partnership with other parts of state government um, are internet connectivity. So we know I mean, this pandemic has showed us that broadband um, for everybody in our state is really, it's key. It's a utility that you, you can't really live without. If you don't have it, your, your kid's gonna have trouble in school. You're not gonna have access to medical care, work opportunities. So that's really a major goal of the governors. And we have, you know, Piscataquis County has less than 75, less than 75% of the people in Piscataquis County don't have access to high speed internet. I mean, that is unacceptable. So for struggling economic areas, we know areas throughout the mid coast that are still struggling with this, that's a major priority focus. Um, I would say the last area um, that is that is economic related is workforce. So Maine still, you know, even in this pandemic, we don't have enough workers for some of the key industries and jobs in our state. So 
how do we make sure that every Mainer who wants a job um, is linked to the best paying job that, that they can um, find in their community? I mean, that's a key focus. So from job training opportunities to keeping our young people here um, to attracting people from out of state to come and take the jobs that are really key that we fill, you know, whether it's healthcare jobs um, or clean energy jobs. So those are, those are the major areas of focus. A lot of it is about our long-term future. Um, but I, I would say, Chuck, I think the, the good news is, is that there, another thing this pandemic has showed us is that Maine is a wonderful state. You know, we're all kind of complaining about some of the people who've stayed here a little too long through the winter, but, you know, to have more taxpayers, to have more workers, um, to, to have more kids in our school, that's an opportunity. And I think I, I see a really bright future for our state. I mean, we all know Maine is a great state. We don't want everyone to move here, but we want it to really prosper. And I, and I think as we come out of this incredibly challenging period, um, Maine is actually well poised for, for pretty bright next couple of years. I'm so glad you see that. I, I feel that we are also gaining maybe not big numbers yet or ever, but we are gaining some really interesting people who are saying, I'm moving to Maine. That's where I want to educate my kids. That's where I want to raise my family. And that gives me hope. That, that can give us all hope because uh, we need a good engaged population. And uh, we also need a good government. And I feel so good that you are part of it and that you and the entire team of Governor Mills are working in one direction to really make Maine a better place. And I thank you for being on the show, but I especially thank you for your good work uh, these days in the administration and I uh, wish you best of luck for the future and uh, feel free to turn to me anytime you need any, any kind of support, I'm, I'm here for you. Awesome, Chuck. We will find ways to keep you busy, but thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thanks for coming on and thank you all for watching. This has been Main Challenge, a production of Lincoln County Television and Lincoln County Indivisible. Glad to have you with us and thank you for coming. Show your support for Maine Challenge and LCTV's programming. We're all about community. Please go to lctv.org to make a contribution. Your support makes us stronger together. Thank you.